Arslan the Bard, Part 3, The Elusive Tavern Arslan stared down at the cartoonishly drawn fox head and then looked back at the mask in his hand. It brought with it a sense of nostalgia at the home he had lost. How could it have all have happened so quickly? His best friend Lillian had been butchered and wouldn't speak to him any longer for some reason. The village now belonged to the carrion, and the king's men themselves had shown up and attacked the few people that had remained. There were even drow mixed into the bodies of the dead, most likely part of the initial attackers. At that moment, Arson closed his eyes and pictured some of them mixed into the bodies. I wonder who my father was, if he truly portrayed the monster mother made him out to be. The stories that drifted only detailed the drow as monsters who indeed killed and used others for their own pleasure. The reason Moth gave him stares of apprehension probably proved justified if that held true. He stared a moment longer at the mask before shoving it into his makeshift bag. Elkswood was about a two days journey. He had never seen it, but had certainly heard of it. Elkswood held renown for its place of worship to Thad, the feline god of revelry. Cassandra had warned him many times never to trust the catmen of Elkswood. He reached out to pick up the parchment. The map left very little to the imagination in part as to how to get to the destination. Well, little guy, you ready for this? The dog looked up and vanished only to appear on his shoulder, startling him. Hmm, how about Blink? The pup looked back at him with a confused look on its face. Well, everyone has to have a name, right? The dog yapped at him and it was settled. Making his way through the door, the parchment he held in front of his face burst into flames. Embers danced across the floor and vanished into a plume of smoke. It's a good thing I'm not totally unfamiliar with the area. They stepped out of the deceptively small building and began orienting to the land around them. Judging from the great orb of flame that illuminated the world, he ascertained their location. A few hours passed and the forest became increasingly dark. Arsum's arms ached from carrying the bag and he decided it was time to take some rest. He had no problem with seeing in the dark, but creatures that skulked about it tended to be more dangerous than their counterparts in the daylight. Blink helped him gather sticks and they fashioned a small fire for the two of them. The night held an eerie cold atmosphere and the wildlife, specifically the crickets, held an opening salvo. Blink looked up at him and wagged its tail. Well, let's get some rest, shall we? He decided to layer up as the cold began to nip at his bones. Dipping through the bag, he found three small sacks neatly tied with a note on it. The fox face had been hastily drawn. Pulling the sacks out, he began looking around him at their campsite with suspicion stamped clearly across his features. How had these gotten here? After a few moments passed, he reassured himself that they were alone and opened one of the sacks. Inside was a familiar pastry that the Balducci had often made back at the village. An elderberry Danish. His stomach couldn't have been more thankful as he bit into the treat. It only then occurred to him that there was a note from a supposed kidnapper of his friends tied to this treat. He squinted at the pastry and then took another bite. His little friend yapped and looked at him with pleading eyes. Naturally, he couldn't resist and fed a quarter of it to him. A few minutes passed and Arsum's stomach felt the fullest it had in his life. The blink dog was laying on its back, its legs sticking lazily into the air and its tongue lolling out the side of its mouth. He had only had part of one pastry. Was it drugged? He didn't know. And partially, he, he didn't care. He just wanted to sleep and let it digest. His dreams brought him back to the fairgrounds, where the village festivals were often held. The air was laden with the smells of meats and pastries, music and banner vibrated the air, and everyone donned animal masks concealing their identities to one another for the most part. It was his favorite time of the lunar cycle, and the one time he didn't meet the sneers he had grown accustomed to. A young girl walked over to him and extended a hand. Her mask was that of a cheetah, decorated with spotted points all leading to a central stripe that ran the center of it. He reached out and grasped it, and was suddenly laying in that cell again holding the false Lillian's hand. As he looked over, her face twisted into a smile, and then continued to twist upward until it wrinkled into an unscrutable mess. A moment later, he saw the old woman, the supposed leader of whatever group had brought him here. She dug a nail into his palm, drawing blood, and then used her other hand to draw something on his forehead. A bright flash enveloped the room, and he was awake again, sweat pooling to the side of his face. He moved to sit up and heard a yelp. Blink had been curled up beside him and he had accidentally palmed his tail. Sorry, little guy. He picked it up and held it to his chest. I had a very interesting dream that brought back good and bad. The dog looked up at him with a false sense of some understanding. 
It then blinked out of his arms and went over to the burnt kindling, raising its hind leg. Arsum figured he could use the opportunity as well. He went to the nearby tree to relieve himself, and as he finished up, he looked up and saw what looked like a humanoid form maybe 50 yards out. It didn't appear to be moving, but looked as if it were staring directly back at him. Come on, Blink. He took off in the direction of the figure, his blade drawn. He stopped a few yards short as the figure came into focus. It was a scarecrow of sorts, fashioned from bits of wood and leaves. It hung about a foot off the ground and had a large red X marking its center. An arrow whizzed past him and embedded itself into the target. Trying to throw off my aim, are ya? Arsum looked behind him quickly but couldn't pinpoint where the voice had come from. Get out of the way, knife ears! Arsum stepped to the side and three more arrows rained into the target in quick succession. He tried to figure out where the arrows were coming from, but judging from the trajectory, there, there was nothing there. Pretty good, aren't I? A cutesy giggle followed, and then Arsum saw a white blur twist elegantly in the air, drawing and firing the bow into the target in one fluid motion, almost 30 yards from where he was standing. Ta-da! A snow-colored cat person with pale blue spots stood, her arms raised above her head. She was maybe five foot tall and wore a leather vest with a small shoulder shroud, van braces, and cloth boots. She made a bow. Aline the Great, thanks all of you. Thank you, thank you, you're all too kind. Arsum looked over at her in awe and slightly in disbelief. She was in her own little world, it seemed, and it was clear she lavished in it. After a moment, she stopped and looked over to Arsum and her expression soured. What do you want, then? A free show? Be off with you. The dog made a yap at her and then blinked directly in front of her. She let out a scream and flailed her arms in front before before the dog blinked back by Arsum, and she stared at the two of them with a hiss. And take that thing with you. Arsum frowned. Come on, Blink. And he turned his back to her and started making his way back towards the campsite. A few hours went by and they eventually came to a large stream landmarking the halfway point of their journey. It appeared muddy and he couldn't make out the bottom of it. Arsum cupped a bit of water into his hands and began speaking a few familiar words Cassandra had taught him. The water began to glow and its imperfections vanished. He placed it to his lips and savored the refreshing taste. He did the same for his new companion, who lapped at it and savored its qualities as well. A scream interrupted their moment of respite. He needed to get to the other side to help. He quickly threw his bag over the eight-foot gap and took a few steps back to get a running start for one of the rocks embedded that he intended to use to cross over. He almost lost his footing but managed to rebalance himself and saw Blink was waiting for him on the other side as he touched solid ground once more. A loud crash broke the air and he refocused himself on aiding whoever was in trouble. The sounds appeared to be coming from a large cave mouth that he could see in the distance. The two of them dashed towards it and stopped a few yards before flanking its mouth and peering inside. The scene was a bit comical, but horrific in its own right. Eline, the Great had been tied to a spit and was now hanging above a large pot where three goblins threw in vegetables and spices. She now had a large fruit shoved into her mouth and struggled to break free. Arsum looked over to Blink and nodded his head while drawing his blade from its scabbard. They stormed in and his blade managed to catch one of the goblins whose back had been turned going through the small pantry of foods piled under the ground. The other two turned to his screams of anguish, surprised to see the half-drow boy standing before them, his blade bloodied. The one that had been stirring the soup pulled the large paddle from the broth and raised it above his head. He ran forward recklessly, but let out a loud yelp as Blink appeared behind him and bit into his hindquarters. That bit of distraction was all Arson needed as he stepped forward, grabbing the shaft of the paddle with one hand and delivering the blade deep into the goblin's gut. He felt a sharp pain in his side and saw that a crudely made spear now stuck into him, although it was fairly shallow. Another nearly missed him, and he mustered everything he had left to close the distance to the final goblin, who raised another in preparation. Blink appeared directly in front of it and squirted a stream of yellow piss into its face, and it winced in pain at the vial of front. Arsum seized the opportunity and grabbed the creature by the throat, driving it into the wall. You're going to pay dearly for that. And with that, he drove his blade into the eye of the last one, its body collapsing to the ground with a sickening thud. He wasted no time jumping onto a small stool and cutting Aline down and removing the fruit that was jammed into her mouth. She stood up and hugged him. Her tears started soaking through his shirt. Her nails were digging deeply into his back and he couldn't help but let out a small grunt of pain. Arsum stood there for a long moment that almost seemed awkward as a full two minutes went by. But he had some empathy and thought no more of it. She looked up. Thank you. 
and drove her face back into his shirt for a moment longer before letting him go. Stepping back, she raised an arm to wipe the remaining tears from her face and walked over to the corner where much of the food lay, where the first goblin had been killed. He noticed a portion of her tail was missing and a bandage extended a few inches of what remained. She reached down and picked up what looked like a small amulet and placed it around her neck. I'm heading to Elmswood. You're more than welcome to come, he said this as if he were walking on eggshells given the recent experience she must have gone through. Thank you. I, I would like that. My troop isn't far from there. She stared at the ground after a moment, and as she collected her thoughts, walked over to the goblin who had been throwing spears. She made a savage kick at its face before recollecting her armor and bow. Would you mind helping me? She said, holding up her van braces. He helped her slip them on, and suddenly she licked his cheek. Arson was startled back, and his face grew a bit red. She beamed a smile at him and started towards the entrance. He looked down at Blink, and the dog gave him a little yap and wagged its tail. They continued their journey towards Elmswood. You mentioned your troop was near Elmswood. Are you a performer? Your marksmanship made me think you were a warrior of sorts. She made a run towards a tree and flipped off of it, landing a bit awkwardly as she stumbled and seemed to have a bit of trouble re-establishing her balance. She looked back at her tail and let out a little sigh. Kane Circus of Wonders, the best show in all of Town Natum. I like to show off by shooting apples off my papa's head while performing my acrobatic feats. The crowd loved me, but the truth is I accidentally took off his ear the last time while doing my ultimate performance, the three-shot moon dance. I ran off and was hoping to find work in Eventurst. Awesome's foot pawed at the ground. Lucky we ran into one another then. The place has become a graveyard, I'm afraid. She looked over at him, a bit of disbelief in her expression. A draw warband seemed to have come through, and the king put everyone left after the skirmish to the sword. I was actually tied and placed in a cart with a few survivors, including my best friend Lillen. Why would King Evan do something like that? My parents only spoke highly of royal family in the kingdom. Arson looked at the dirt he had been kicking. Supposedly my people were cannibals, and that was enough to condemn the entire village. A tear mottled the dirt at his feet, and his thoughts came back to some of those villagers he saw lying dead in the streets. I learned the truth of Quran, our God, their God, and found that there was probably truth to these words. There were so many bodies. When we tried to escape, a group of men firing metal rods appeared. My mother contorted and turned into some kind of monster and began killing one after another. Eventually, she died, and I was helpless to help her. A woman drove a spear into my back, and blackness overtook me. People in mass stood over me, and one of my best friends was at my side holding my hand. Only, it wasn't truly her. Lillian had used one of her pyromancies and blinded all of them, including that imposter, and we ran. She had a cut that had been infected, and I went to search for medicine, but when I returned, she was gone. Arson punched a nearby tree. I'm such an idiot. What was I thinking? But she needed help. Eileen walked over and placed a hand on his shoulder. I take it that's your reason to travel to Elmswood. Arson nodded, visibly growing calmer at her reassuring touch. Best we don't waste any more time then. And with that, they continued until the sun retreated behind the towering trees. They found a small clearing and began setting up camp. Eileen and Blink now seemed to be quite chummy. The two of them ran off while Arson gathered up some kindling to burn. By the time the fire had been started, they had returned, Eileen carrying a large boar carcass, Blink close behind her. Let's eat! Arson skillfully carved up the beast and hung the skin on a nearby branch to dry out. They speared a few pieces and cooked them over the fire beside one another. Arson's mind immediately went back to the time he had shared with Lillian, and his heart dropped in his chest. A smile and a nudge snapped him out of his rut as his gaze found Eileen and Blink. Solace enveloped him and he reached out to take one of the sticks. They enjoyed each other's company and mourning was upon them before they knew it. Arson practically peeled himself off of the ground, the heat from both Blink and Eileen warming him to the point he was a sweaty mess. Both of them were curled up on the ground still and he decided to change clothes. He started through his sack and let out a small gasp as he noticed the mask had been broken. Damn it he said aloud. Eileen hopped up and walked over. What's wrong? The mask. I was supposed to bring it to Elmswood. It's ruined. She picked it up, 
and a faint glow overtook it before the whole thing went from two pieces to ten. Arson looked down at the pieces as Aline apologized profusely while picking them up. No matter, he said, picking up the remaining remnants and placing them into another sack. I'll save her regardless of whatever they have in store for me. With that, he passed his hand over his clothes and cleaned them to the best of his ability. Blink was up by now and was already nipping at some of the leftover from the boar dressings. They continued their journey and eventually came upon the town of Elmswood. The first thing they noticed was a 40-foot tall statue of a large cat person with a lute nestled in his hands poised to play. The town was absolutely bustling with life. People were all about the streets shouting and already drinking it would seem. Aileen took Arson's hand. Come on! He was practically dragged behind her as she pulled him towards the entry point. Two feline guards stood at its entrance, both dressed in plate mail and wielding large halberds. One had a black coat while the other was calico. What brings you to Elmswood, fair lass? The calico cat said. Aileen made a small bow. We come to bask in the revelry of the almighty Thad, of course. The black one raised his halberd into the air and dug his paw into a pouch at his side, producing a flask and taking a swig. Well said, missy. As they began to pass through, Arsum turned. Uh, pardon me, do you happen to know where I could find the Red Mead's tavern? The guards both turned to him with a quizzical stare. Never heard of it, the calico one said. And I know every bar and tavern in the joint. With that, the three of them continued through. The map from before hadn't specified anything more than this town. His brow grew frustrated. Eileen had a huge smile on her face and was practically dancing about the streets as the place was so lively. Arson could only compare it to the festivals where the music had vibrated the air and the fresh sausages were smoked for all to savor. It wasn't long before a small, very small man with a large pointed hat came up to them with a tray of cheese cubes and another tray of flagons. Welcome! Welcome to Elmswood! Where the grass is always green and the drinks run bottomless. Have a flagon. And the second they picked it up, it filled to the brim with a sweet-smelling liquid. If you want to change what you have, just make your way to any tavern, and they'll change it out for you. For now, enjoy our signature maiden's kiss brew. Arsum took a swig and cooed at the fullness of the flavor. It was an absolute pleasure that seemed to reach the depths of his very soul. He thanked the gnome and asked about the Red Mead's Tavern to no avail. Sorry, friend, can't say I've heard of that one, and I'm mayor. <laughs> Arsum couldn't help but start feeling stressed. Perhaps you've heard of the Wolf of the Elm, then? The second the words had left his lips, the mayor's face grew dark. Speak that name not in the streets, newcomer. With that, he beckoned him to follow and went into a nearby building, a sign reading the bobbing barrel. As they entered, they saw a series of barrels set up, each with a different kind of food in it and a ladle cradled against each. He led them past the many delicacies and into the back room where a small office was. Hey, Michaela, I'm borrowing your office for a moment. Another gnome walked around the corner and her build was quite voluptuous. She wagged a finger at the mayor gnome. Make it quick, Harold. We have matters to see to tonight. She gave him a wink and Harold the gnome stood a foot taller. O all right then, so you want to find the wolf? Arsum nodded and the mayor began telling them of stories past. Fifty years ago, there was a child who bounced from foster home to foster home in our great town. Most called him Yugo. For some reason, every home that fostered him would give him up, claiming he was a were-animal of sorts. Most thought people were just playing poppycock, but by the fourth family, most started to believe that the unfounded rumors might be true. Yugo was ostracized. The few friends he had wanted nothing to do with him, and as a consequence, he was utterly alone. No home would take him, and he ended up in the streets. One day, the richest family in town, the Dolphin Hills, invited him to stay with them. They had an excess of space, and their philosophy was the only bodies that belonged in the streets were drunk who didn't quite make it home. Hugo smiled for the first time in a long time, but the sad reality was soon to come. The family had planned to kill Hugo on the next lunar cycle. The family turned up dead, and the boy was missing. The only thing found beside their mangled corpses was a festival mask in the form of a wolf. The mask had decorative markings made with the blood surrounding it. Thankfully Thad, the youngest son, had been away studying at the Bard College at the time, but he decided to travel with close relatives of the Tabaxi clan. The house pretty much had fallen to disrepair as the rights were still paid, however it remains vacant. Arson looked quizzically at the mayor for a moment. 
fad, as in the god of revelry, one and the same? The gnome slapped his palm to his face. In name only, son. Now then, if you're satisfied, I would ask you not to speak that horrendous name in our merry city. Arsa, Elise, and Harold made their way into the main dining area where a small commotion had broken out. Patrons cheered as a relatively obese yellow coat feline chef ran back and forth between the barrels trying to swat a small dog who was dipping its face in each and nipping at the food. Get out of here, you little mongrel! Oh, little guy, give old Alberto some exercise. Alberto the chef was visibly fatigued and looked over to the man who had made a crack about him. Out! Out of my restaurant! The man ignored him and went back to enjoying the show. Arthur went towards the door and shouted, Blink! And the three of them left fairly unnoticed in the commotion. Just outside the door, they could hear Harold laying into the tabaxi about allowing wild animals into the shop. That's a bad dog, Blink. We don't take food that doesn't belong to us. Elise looked over. Ah, oh, he can't help it. Arsom looked at her just in time to see her popping a familiar exotic fruit piece into her mouth. She gave him a wink and he sighed in defeat. I really need to find the Red Mead Tavern. Doesn't anyone in this forsaken town know where it is? A half-naked orc walked up to him, his cheeks tinged scarlet from drink. Did you say Red Mead? I love Red Mead. C come on! and he drifted left and right about twenty yards before collapsing to the ground. Well, that certainly didn't help, Elise chuckled. Come on, let's enjoy the activities. She smiled brightly. Arsom's face crunched. Listen, my friend is in grave danger. She could be being tortured for all I know. Elise looked down, realizing how upset she had made him. Arsom pulled back, seeing the brightness drain from his new companion. Listen, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure she's not hurt. Maybe we could ask Papa? He knows everything. Arsom sat on the ground in the middle of the street and closed his eyes for a moment. The only thing he had been given other than the Red Mead's Tavern was the signature Wolf of the Elm. This Hugo guy was probably related, but that was also fifty years ago according to the gnome. His eyes opened. The house, maybe that was it? Someone had been paying a bill for a vacant property for this long, there must be more to it. Dear listeners, it is now time for you to decide the path for our protagonist to choose. Should he, one, listen to Elise's suggestion? Perhaps the carnival master would know more of the Red Mead's Tavern or the Wolf of the Elm. Two, investigate the vacant manor of the late Dauphino family. Someone's been paying the bill, and, you know, that's suspicious enough in its own right, I'd say. Or three, <laughs> wait for the half-naked orc man to wake up and ask about the Red Mead he had mentioned. Your vote will decide where the story goes next. Don't like the options? Please comment below, and if you receive the most likes, the story will be written in that direction. Let's write a story. Let's play a game. Without the dice.